We're in a series, if you all are visiting, um, it's a Christmas series, and what we've decided to do is to take each one of the Gospels and, and talk about how in Christ we've been given something. You know, during the Christmas season, it's always, you know, we've been given a Savior, but each, each one of the Gospels kind of, kind of communicates something different about Jesus. So in the first part of this series, we, we dealt with the Gospel of Matthew, and in Matthew, he gives us the perspective of Jesus as the King. Um, and then secondly, last week, Harry, via online services while we were all snowed in and iced in, Harry brought us the book of Mark, which gives us the perspective of Jesus as a servant. And this morning, I have the privilege of bringing to you the gospel of Luke, Dr. Luke. And Luke um, gives us the perspective of Jesus as a man. As a matter of fact, 26 times in the book of Luke, we hear Jesus referencing to himself as the son of man, the son of man. And so as we peer into the book of Luke, we will see hopefully Jesus as a man. So all of the miracles and all the life that he lived, we want to see him as a man. And I know that for some of us, it's kind of difficult because we see Jesus and Jesus is the God man. And so we kind of see him from that perspective. So it's really difficult for us to see Jesus as someone, as a baby in need. You know, as we think about the creator of the universe, the holder together of all of the cosmos, yet he allowed himself to be robed in flesh and come as an infant who is very dependent on mom and dad and for sustenance and for all of those things. That's pretty amazing to me. But as we walk through the scriptures, and I'm going to walk through them real quick, so have your pen ready. You're going to write down a lot. Because you're going to have to go home and be like the Bereans and check all of the stuff that I say. Amen? So write it down because I really don't have enough time to cover all of Luke in 35 minutes. It's just not going to happen. And so anyway, um, we want to talk about Jesus as the Son of Man. And that term, the Son of Man, is an indication that Jesus was fully human. Fully human. 100% man, yet he was also 100% God. Can you understand that whole hypostatic union? I mean, I just, I don't understand it at all, but it's not for us to understand. The word of God says it, so what? We believe it. Amen? And so, but, but, but we want to focus in on Jesus as a man today, and as we focus, is, focus in on him as a man, we really get the sense that he's coming as a man early on in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, write that down. It's called this big old... Uh, uh, theological term, the proto-evangelium. Proto meaning first, evangelium meaning evangelist. The first evangelistic message of the scriptures was found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and it says that the woman's seed will crush the head of the serpent although the serpent will bruise his heel. That has everything to do with the birth of a savior who will then grow up Right? Baby Jesus never continued to be baby Jesus. He did grow up. You know that, right? <laughs> Amen. And so <laughs> he grew up, became a man, and he allowed himself to be stretched out on a cross where he uh, 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 delivered a death blow to the head of the, the enemy. Although he bruises heel. And so as we look at this, we see from Genesis 3.15 all the way up through the, 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 the writer of Hebrews. And let me read this scripture before we jump into the gospel of Luke. Turn, if you, if you have the time and you have your copy of God's Word, to Hebrews. Do a little teaching real quick before we jump into the book of Luke. Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to start at verse 14, and it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their, what? Humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. And free those who are all their lives were held in slavery and their fear of death. That's us. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers. How was that? In the flesh, as a human, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. Look at this. He is able to help those who are being tempted. We're going to talk about that in a minute. 
So let's deal with Jesus as a human, as an amazing human. You know, one of, the, uh, one of my favorite Marvel characters was Spider-Man. Y'all remember Spider-Man? I mean, back in the day. Now, they got all this new stuff now, but back, like the comic book Spider-Man. He was the man. Right? The ama- they always get the am- I remember my comic book. It's big red letters. The Amazing Spider-Man. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Some of y'all are too young to remember that. <laughs> but I remember that story. And, and the, the whole story is this is just this basic, you know, young guy, this, this uh, 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 cameraman for the, 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 the uh, what is it, the Bugle? Daily Bugle? Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes. Right? This, this cameraman for the Daily Bugle, and, uh, and for whatever reason, he becomes this amazing superhero. How and why? Well, because he was privileged to be bitten by a spider, a radioactive spider. It's a good story. <laughs> and so this radioactive spider then, in, I mean, he infuses some of his DNA into this cameraman, and now he becomes this amazing Spider-Man, shooting the webs out of his hands and crawling up walls and all kinds of crazy, amazing things. And as I was studying this the other day, I thought to myself, man, why was it that in, 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 in throughout the book of Luke, you hear often that when Jesus does something, it says that the people were amazed. Or you'll hear in awe. And I thought, but why, why, why so amazed? Like, for us looking back on Jesus, we're not that amazed, are we? Because we already know that Jesus was the God-man. But the reason that people in that time were so amazed is because Jesus was, in fact, a man. He was just a man. Yet, he was God. And so as I walk through the book of Luke, I just want to look at the life of Jesus and see what we can glean as those who were, are just like him, flesh and blood. So in the very beginning, verse chapter 2, uh, Luke lays out this, this, this very detailed account as we see in the, ver- the first part of Luke. He's writing this book as well as the book of Acts. He wrote to this guy named Theophilus. Now, the reason that he wrote is because he wanted to give a very detailed account. Verse 4 of chapter 1, he says, So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So obviously, Theophilus was taught some things, just like we have been taught many things in this country because we have all this education about the scriptures and about glory and about God and all of that stuff. But Luke is saying, man, I'm writing this thing because I want you to understand that stuff. And so as he writes, he's giving us this, he gives us the, 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 the greatest detail of the first point that I want to make. And, I, and this is it. Jesus as a man was born. You're like, duh. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what Christmas is all about? Yeah. But, but that's amazing, and is it not? Like, like so Spider-Man became uh, amazing because he was bitten by a spider. Not by anything that, he didn't roll over to the spider and say, hey man, can you bite me for a second? I want to be a superhero. God did just that. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus was, listen, he's in glory receiving praise and honor from the angels. And he says, before the foundations of the world, I will go and robe myself in flesh. And I will come as an infant, a baby, one who is in need, constant need of others. The creator of the universe. Can y'all get, can you grasp that concept for a second? But, but, but he had to do that, number one, because he had to fulfill prophecy. Number two, because he had to come as a man. Chapter 2, verse 4, real quick, he says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. Check verse number six real quick. I'm about to blow your dome, okay? I'm going to blow your dome about your understanding of the nativity scene. Don't get mad at me, all right? It says, while they were there. Y'all see that? The time came for the baby to be born. Let me stop right there for a second. So they weren't trucking in with the wind blowing in the nighttime with Mary riding on a donkey and looking, knocking on doors of hotels. 
it says while they were there, they were already in the city. So they didn't come and, you know, get out, you got to go out on the side of that hill where that thatched roof little thing is and have the baby out there. Y'all are like, wait a minute, I have that nativity scene out on my lawn, don't do this. <laughs> While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in, wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room there in the inn. So they were in the house. Why would they run and go to look for a hotel to stay in? That word in there is the Greek word kataluma. It means a guest room. So in a first century home, there's a main area where you, you do all of your cooking and eating and sleeping, and then there's this room that's right around the corner from the main area, and that room is called the Cataluma. It's a guest room. That's where we get the translation in from. I don't know why. I don't know why we came up with in. Maybe we didn't have another good, better word. I don't, I'm not sure. But Jesus was born in a first century home, in the basement of that home. That's where the animals stayed in a first century home. Y'all just think that through. Y'all will catch it when you get home. So, so, so but the, the point of all of this is Jesus was born as a baby. And yes, he was laid in a manger. It was just because those mangers were in the basements of the first century homes. But even as a man, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Why? He was a Jewish boy. Yes, he was God in flesh. We know that. But Luke is very detailed in saying Okay, on the eighth day, they took him to the temple to be circumcised because that's what Jewish boys were supposed to do according to the law. And it then goes on further to say that Jesus was actually consecrated to the Lord in the temple. Why? Because he was human. That's what humans did. Nobody said, now, wait a minute, this is God in flesh. He doesn't need consecration. He's consecrating us. No, they were saying he was a man. So he has to go through all of this stuff. And guess what happens to Jesus at the age of 13? He has a bar mitzvah. Wait a minute, what? Yes, he's a Jewish boy. Luke is communicating all of this that he wants us to know from the very beginning that God is human. Then Jesus grows up. And right around the age of 30, you know, we, we, we leave him at 12 in the temple. I don't have time to get into all of that, but he's in the temple. He's talking to the, the, uh, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rabbis, and they're asking him questions. He's asking questions. They are, again, amazed, the amazing son of man, not the amazing Superman, the amazing son of man. They're amazed at his, his understanding, his wisdom, and all of that. And then we don't see Jesus again until he's almost 30 years old. And he shows up at the river, and he's, he's baptized. Why? Because Scripture says that we have to do that, that he had to fulfill all righteousness is what the Scripture tells us. And so he's baptized, and this amazing spiritual thing happens. The heavens open, and God looks down on him and says, man, that's my boy. I am well pleased with him. Then the Spirit of the Lord comes down like a dove and rests on him, and right there we have the triune Godhead in person. Y'all see that? Jesus out of the water, the Holy Spirit's on him, God's speaking, the triune Godhead right there. Beautiful spiritual experience. And then look at what happens. Verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1. After the baptism, we got a little genealogy thing going on with Jesus. I don't have time to get in there. But Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, verse 1, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert to do what? Hang out and drink uh, 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 strawberry uh, drinks and stuff? No. <laughs> he was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was to be tempted by the devil. What can we learn by the humanness of Jesus in this passage? Not only is he born, but he is also tempted as a man. Now, I just read Hebrews to you earlier because it says he was tempted in all points, yet he did not sin. So as a man, what do we learn from Jesus? We too will be tempted. Now, most of you are like, man, that's just old news. 
Why are you still falling then? Why when he comes are you so like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Right? Because we miss and we forget that just like Jesus was tempted, we too will be tempted and tempted often. The question is, what do we learn from Jesus, the human being, in this passage of scripture that we can use in our own temptation? What is it that we learn? We need the word of God. Every time the enemy came at Jesus, what did he say? It's written, man. Don't you know? It is written. Right? And, and here's the thing. The enemy was coming at him with the word. You know the enemy knows the word of God better than we know it. He knows it enough where he can twist it to say what he wants it to say. So in other words, if you don't know the word of God, guess what? You're going to be like Eve. He came to Eve and said, man, did he really say that? See, here's the problem with temptation when we go through it. And if we look, if we look at the example of Jesus, he knew the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the word. Right. But as a human, he knew the word. So it was like the enemy comes at him. Temptation hits you. You're not. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get my, com my, my commentaries. Let me get my. Uh, my uh, what, let me see. You don't have time to do all of that when temptation comes, do you? When temptation comes, this is you and whatever word you have stored in your heart so that you might not sin against the Lord. Psalm 111. I mean, Psalm 119. Are y'all feeling me? So what do we learn from Jesus? Man, I, I got to be a student of the word, not just so I can walk around because I have some knowledge and I have some good gospel nuggets so that when I get with my friends, I can be like, well, you know, I was in John the other day and <laughs> the spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And, uh, man, let me tell you about some stuff. Right. It ain't all about that. So what? So what? You know, the word of God, if it is not transforming your lives, it's just a bunch of information. And the way you transform your life is when the enemy comes at you, you're ready. Man, it's written. It's written. It's written. Here's the other thing we can learn from Jesus and his humanity with this whole passage of this temptation. Look at verse number 12, 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, what does it say? He left him until an opportune time. I'm going to be back. You ever, you, ever, you ever went, I've had times in my life where I have been victorious in temptation. I wish it was a whole more, a lot more times than it, but I've had times in my life when I've been victorious in temptation. And I'm like, yeah, got it. And then what do I do? I let my guard down like, whoo. And then here comes that opportune time. Here he's right back. Right back. And what we see in this passage is, um, Jesus returned to Galilee in verse 14 in the power of the Spirit. So after all of the temptation, he didn't let his guard down. He was still powered by the Spirit of the Lord. He was born a man. He was tempted as a man. Thirdly, he is rejected as a man. What do we learn from Jesus? 14, he returns to Galilee in the spirit and news about him spread through the whole country. He taught there in the synagogues and everyone praised him because they loved his teaching. He went to Nazareth where he was born and raised, you all. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. I love this. He said, the spirit, it says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. <laughs> Look, then all the eyes of them were fastened on Jesus. And he began by saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let me tell you all something. Is Jesus not cool? <laughs> now, I hope that doesn't offend. I hope that doesn't offend some people here. I said it in Conway like two years ago, and it offended somebody. But Jesus is cool. He stands up. He reads the scripture, rolls it back up, gives it to a tenant. <laughs> and everybody's looking at him like, what's he going to say next? And he says, today. 
I'm right here. Now, if that were you, what would you do? What would you do? Now, listen, he's a man. See, we, we forget that. We, 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 we look at the scriptures in hindsight. So for us, we'd be like, oh, I would worship him. I would get down on my knees and praise him. If you were in Nazareth and you knew Jesus as the son of Joseph, who was a carpenter, I think we probably would have responded the way these people responded. After he says that, all spoke well of him and were, there it is again, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said a few more things. I got to go quickly through this. And then verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to, to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now, I've been to Nazareth. I've stood on this hill. That was a boy. He was gone if they threw him over that cliff. I'm going to tell you right now. These are the people of his town. Family members. Folks who know your past. Folks who even know your present. Christmas time is coming up. Y'all visiting family? Are you the holy roller of the family? The church goer? The folks that always have something to say about Jesus? You ever receive any rejection from your family? Or coworkers or other folks who just don't understand this whole Jesus thing? We can learn some things from Jesus the man, and that is when you walk with the Lord, sometimes you will be rejected. Not all the time, but sometimes people just won't get you. I guess the question you would ask yourself is, am I okay with that? Or am I still in that, I like to call it that, that teenage phase where, you know, as teenagers, we got to be accepted a lot. Being in, in with the group is important. It's, it's paramount. Like, if I don't have my, my group, there's something wrong with me. And so if we, if, as we're serving the Lord, as we're talking about Jesus, and, and, and people begin to reject us, are we okay with that? Even if it's mom and dad, brother or sister. See, there's a lot we can learn from this man, Jesus, as we peer through the portions of, uh, of Luke. He's rejected as a man. But then as the God-man, he performs miracles. Because what happens here is we see him born. We see him go through the temptation. He's baptized. He gets tempted. He's rejected by his own people. And then he's up in this region of the Galilee called the Evangelical Triangle. And believe it or not, 90% of Jesus' ministry is performed within that triangle. Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. Those are the three cities. 90% of his ministry is done in, the, in those areas. And so that he gets, he, 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 so he's done, he's, as the God-man, he performs a number of miracles. And I have no time to get into all of them. But in chapter 5, he heals this paralytic guy. And again, as the man, Jesus is preaching in this building, and these guys come. It's chapter 5. I can't read it because I don't have time. But it's chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. And again, I love this. And 26, again, it says, everyone was amazed. Why were they amazed? Because this is simply a man who's teaching. It's as if I was, I was standing here teaching right now, and as I'm teaching, somebody starts busting a hole in the wall right here. And then some guy comes down on this rope. And I say, man, get up and walk. What would you all say? <laughs> I only say that because you, that, that is the, that's the mindset of the people in that building. Like they, again, it's real difficult for us to see Jesus as human because we know he is God. But if you, if you take it from the perspective of the people in that building, I think, first of all, they'd have been upset. Can you imagine all that dust and stuff falling on their heads as they're busting holes in the wall? I, I'm sorry. I just think about that kind of stuff. When I'm reading scripture, it's a story. Like, 
It's narrative. So I'm thinking all of that. Like, what were the people doing as they're standing there watch, listening to Jesus and all of a sudden all of this wood and stuff falling on it? I would be kind of mad. Like, what are y'all doing, man? I'm trying to listen to the word. But Jesus stops as the man. He stops and he says, oh, here's an opportunity for me to show folks that I'm the God man. That I'm not just a man, but I'm the God man. And he does. He heals this guy. And again, everyone was amazed and they gave praise to God. Chapter 7, write it down. He, I love this part about Jesus because as a man, he has so much compassion. Now, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, we have this story of Jesus healing a centurion's servant. I love this story because Jesus stops to heal a servant. The servant stops to heal a servant, as we heard last week in, in Mark. So in verse 1, it says, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and there a centurion servant whom his master valued highly. I love that. Do you value the people who serve you highly? I mean, those, those low-level folks. When you go out to dinner after church, do you value your servant? You grab their hand as they're coming to service. Hey, can you, you want to pray with us? We're getting ready to pray. Do you pray for them and their families? You value them highly? You in the Walmart, you, people are serving you. Even if they don't, listen, even if they don't serve you well, do you value them? This centurion, man, he had hundreds under him. That's what a centurion soldier was all about. Yet he valued this servant enough to send people to Jesus so that he might be healed. When I read this, I was like, man, do I really value the people that serve me? Do you value our children's workers in there that have your kids? Them little snotty-nosed kids? I'm talking about mine, too. I can say that because I got them back there. But do you value that they're, they're, they're teaching our children the word of God on their level? Many of our kids will come to Christ because of the servants that are in our children's ministry. I got one hand clap. Many of your children will come to Christ because of the... Jesus heals this guy and uh, his servant. And, um, and, and verse 9, I love it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and turned to the crowd following him and said, listen, I haven't found this kind of faith even in Israel. It says, the men went back to the house and servants healed. They're seeing the God man. Then he raises this widow's son. And again, in 16 of chapter 7, they were all filled with awe and praised God. That amazement again. Chapter 8, uh, we have the parable of the sower. Right? Jesus, I don't have time, but Jesus talks about this whole parable. He's teaching. As a rabbi, he's teaching. But then before we even get to the teaching part, uh, he, he, he calms the storm in the same chapter, chapter 7. Let's not get by that. He heals, he, he, um, he's, he's anointed by this sinful woman. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus, you're only supposed to be anointed by godly people. He's a man, man. Listen, I, I, I love to be uh, 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 sought after. I love to be in community. Uh, this woman has chosen to anoint me. She knows something that you all don't even know. Chapter 80 exercises demons, calms the storm. This woman with the issue of blood, he stops. He's on his way to heal or to bring a dead girl back to life. And on his way, this woman touches him, who's had an issue of blood for years. He heals her. This is the God man now. And then in chapter 9, he feeds 5,000. We understand all of that. I don't have time to get into the principles that we pull out of these narratives, but I just want to show you, and you can just continue to go through, Luke, because there are so many more miracles that Jesus is performing as a man. Understand what the people are seeing. They're seeing the man from Nazareth, Jesus, you know, Joseph's son, the carpenter. 
He just calmed the sea. A sharkia came on the sea, this big windstorm. It was crazy. And Jesus said, listen, peace. That man, the one from Nazareth, yeah, he did that. They began to see him as the God-man. And, and then as a man, Jesus was a rabbi. And as a rabbi, he taught people. Why? Because that was the job of a rabbi. He, was, he had rabbinical authority because people looked at him as the authority on Scripture. And, and other things, authority politically, all of that stuff. And so as a rabbi, we see in the book of Luke a lot of teaching. But let me real quickly just give you something to read over this week. Chapter 6, Jesus is teaching about our love for our enemies. I know y'all want to hear that one. <laughs> Chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. Jesus says some crazy stuff like, listen, pray for those who mistreat you. And when they smack you upside the head, go turn to the other side and let them smack you again. I ain't quite got there yet. But what he's saying, listen, as a man, he's saying you should be in a position where I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can love your enemies. And the reason you're loving your enemies is because we sang it earlier. It is not about us. It's all about him. And so if through the loving of my enemies, Jesus meets them in their hearts and they come to Christ, then that's what it's all about. So you say, man, I don't know about that. Well, that's, that's, he ties our love for the enemy with the gospel. He's teaching. Talks about judging others, verse 37 through 42 in Luke chapter 6. Chapter 8, write this down, the parable of the sower. Talk about how the sower is spreading the seed. It goes back to the word of God. I love the question that's asked by his disciples. In verse 9, his disciples asked him, what does this mean? Now, Jesus is teaching this parable to a, a huge group of people. It's like people in this room. This word is going out. Some of you are receiving it, and some of you are writing down notes. Hopefully, you go home and you look at those notes. Some of you, I'd, I'd love to see you go home and ask Jesus, like, what was he really saying? Really, what were you really saying, Jesus? Jesus. See, because some of the disciples, and disciples were everybody that were followers of Christ. It wasn't the apostles necessarily. They were always in that number, but it was the apostles. And then the disciples were like big crowds like this. Jesus would teach all the time as a rabbi. And he would teach in parables a lot. And only sometimes would the disciples come back and say, now, what, what did you really mean there? You all ever do that when you're studying scripture? You ever ask God like, okay, Jesus, what, what do you really mean here? You know those passages you just kind of read by because they don't really make a whole lot of sense? Stop there next time and just wait and say, God, something's here. I know it. I just, I feel like you're trying to say something, but I don't get it. This is like one of those parables, one of those heavenly stories with this earthly meaning. And you, I, I hear about the trees and the sores and all that, but what, what are you really saying? What was that guy there talking about? You, you being a man, Jesus. Come, I'm looking at some of these scriptures that he pulled out. Can you speak to me? And that's what these disciples did here. And then Jesus goes on to tell them, this is the meaning of the parable, verse 11. The seed is the word of God. So Jesus is saying, as a man, he's teaching, as a rabbi, some of you will get this and some of you won't. Because some of you will leave here and the cares of this world will just rip everything that you just heard. <laughs> right? That roast beef that you burnt is gone. Don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. You can go buy another one. Don't miss the word, though. Right? You get to work tomorrow. Oh, we had a great service yesterday. And somebody gets on your nerves the minute you walk in. And, and Jesus is saying, man, sometimes the cares of this earth will just strip everything that I did in you the, the day before. We're learning. We're learning from Luke, right? Verse 12. Oh, chapter 12, I'm sorry. The rabbi is still teaching. And this is a message that I love, and I, I think most Americans would love this message. It's verses 14 through 21. The rabbi is talking about greed. And he te again, the rabbi is teaching. The man Jesus is teaching because that's his job description. 
All right, and so again, chapter, uh, verses 13 through 21, check it when you get home. Then he talks about worry, not worrying about some things. Anybody worried in here today? You worried about us coming up on this Christmas holiday? You don't have enough? He just talked about greed, then he gets into worry because he knows that most people, what they're worrying about most is money. What they don't have. How much they don't have. So Jesus is teaching them and he's teaching us not to worry. He's got us. He's in control. Right? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Do y'all believe that? Amen. Are you sure? Amen. First chapter 15, I taught on this a few weeks back, the parable of the loving father. Right? Luke 15, not the parable of... The prodigal son, right? That's not it. It's the parable of the loving father. That's actually the running father. But the whole parable, all of Luke 15, is what? The parable of the loving father. Y'all remember that? Shub. Do y'all remember that? Yeah. All right. So I, I'm not going to get into that. All right. Lastly, Jesus shows us who he is as a man and as a friend as he speaks well of John. Luke chapter 7. After he raises the widow's son, John is now in, in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus. And here's a crazy question, and I want you to see it. Verse 18, John's disciples told him about all the things, and those all things were the things that Jesus was doing. Calling two of them, he sent, from, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one to come, or should we expect somebody else? Now, that's a crazy question. Who asked that question? John the Baptist. It's the same dude that said, hey, that's the one. There's the, there's the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sins of the world. That's him right there. That's what I've been telling you all about. John, John the Baptist, the one who leapt in his mother's womb when Mary came in with Jesus in her womb. That John. They were cousins. They probably grew up together. John, how do you get to a place where you're saying, ask that joke, is he the one? He got there because he was in trouble. And we laugh, but don't we do the same thing? When trouble hits us, I mean like real trouble, like deep trouble. Have you ever said, Jesus, uh, are you really the one? And you may not have asked it that way, but in your heart you begin to doubt. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know, God. I mean, surely you wouldn't put me in this position. I'm your child. And everybody in America says, I'm supposed to be blessed and all, everything's supposed to be sweet and rosy. And, and I'm not in that place right now, Jesus. Are you the one? See, if you believe the lie that's been told, then sometimes you'll get there. But I love Jesus' response to all of this. He tells them all that he's doing. He's like, man, are you the one or should I expect somebody else? He said, listen, go back and tell them I'm healing the sick, the blind are, being, are, being, are, are, are seeing, the lame are walking, all of that stuff. And then he turns and he says this. He starts talking about John. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him. And here's how he finishes. Verse 20, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. And he says this in the context of John's doubt about him. Now, isn't that a, that's the kind of friend that I want. See, Jesus as a man shows me what kind of friend to be. In the midst of him doubting what he could do for him, he's like, man, listen, among women, there's not one born that's better than John. You want that kind of friend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And lastly, as we close, as a man, Jesus suffered and died. Now, I don't, I'm not going into that because next week we'll be in John and we'll talk all about the Savior and how he had to die in order to save us. But as a man, imagine suffering the way he did. Rejection, we already talked about that. As a man, remember Jesus suffering, the community that he had for all of those years, three years, hanging with all of his boys, they sleeping together in the same quarters, eating together, hanging. 
And then when, it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when the rubber meets the road, they all desert him. As a man, can you imagine feeling like that? Just lonely. You ever felt lonely? Here's what I want you to, to learn from this. In your loneliness, remember Hebrews chapter 2, he understands. If nobody else understands your loneliness, the person who was on his way to the cross and all of his friends left, do you think he might know a little something about loneliness? So as you're praying to him, even this Christmas, I, real, I realize that Christmas for some people is tough. Because Christmas for some people is like remembering loved ones who are not here anymore. And you're feeling really, really lonely. I'm saying talk to the man Jesus because as a man, he experienced all of that. And he can empathize with where you are. Does that make sense? In the garden, he just wants them to stay awake to pray with him. As a man, dude, can y'all just hang with me, man? I'm, I'm struggling with this decision. They gone to sleep. Loneliness in the garden, on his way to the cross. And obviously on the cross, he's all alone because there's nobody else that could take what he had to take for you and for me. Jesus the man. The next time you read the book of Luke, remember that he was the amazing son of man for you and for me. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. Your word is good. It's rich. It's informative. It's also convicting. It instructs us in righteousness so that all of us might be thoroughly equipped for every good work that you've called us to. And so, God, I pray that you would use this message and anything else that your spirit desires to use to mold us, to shape us into the people of God that you desire us to be. Lord, use us this week. Use us throughout this holiday as we are with family members, Lord. If there are members that are hurting, God, would you use us to minister to them as you work through us to get to them? God, I pray that through us that even some of our family members might come to know you personally, Father. That's my desire. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you again. Um, you never let us down, God. You always speak to our hearts. And I thank you that this word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish everything that you desire to, for it to accomplish in the people that it went into. In Jesus' name, amen.